Hi, this is Dr. Bueller, and we're going to be going through a very, very brief overview of female sexual anatomy. The major organs that are involved in female sexual anatomy are going to be the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. The ovaries are attached to the uterus via ligaments, and the ovaries contain the immature follicles and immature eggs. With follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, those eggs are going to mature and they're going to be released. They should be taken up within the fallopian tubes and go down toward the uterus. At the bottom of the uterus, we have a smooth muscle called the cervix, and that should close the uterine environment from the vagina. The vagina itself is also made of smooth muscle. So the uterus, the vagina, and the cervix all are smooth muscle, and they're all able to contract down. Let's go ahead and erase those out, and we'll go through each individual step. So in the ovary itself, we have the stimulation and maturation of the follicles and ovulation of the egg. The egg should enter the fallopian tube, and that is where fertilization should occur. If sperm come up and enter the uterus and swim up through the fallopian tube, they should meet the egg there, and a fertilized egg would then be produced, which would then move down and implant within the uterus itself. So that fertilized egg is going to travel down to the uterus. If a fertilized egg doesn't travel down to the uterus but remains in the fallopian tube, that's called a tubal pregnancy because it's in the tube, or an ectopic pregnancy, which means outside of. That can be very dangerous because as the embryo grows, it then can rupture the fallopian tube and cause serious damage to the mother. And obviously, it's not a viable pregnancy um, for the embryo itself because it's not inside the endometrial lining where it's going to get nutrients. The uterus itself is made of smooth muscle and it's actually about the size of your closed fist. So it's not very large in a non-pregnant woman. The top of the uterus is called the fundus and that's important because if something is being inserted into the uterus like an IUD, then it's important that it not be inserted too far up. Here, I'm going to try to draw a little IUD here. Then it's important that it not be inserted too far up into the uterus so that it doesn't actually puncture the top of the uterine muscle. Those are ugly IUDs. The endometrial cells are going to line the interior of the uterus. And the endometrial cells, as we are going to draw them down here, are going to be a thin lining after a menstrual period at the beginning of the growth of the endometrium cycle. As estrogen is being produced within the female cycle, those cells are going to replicate and the endometrial lining is going to get larger and larger. As you have these cells, they're going to need blood supply and capillaries are growing to grow in, and blood supply and blood vessels are going to become a large part of that. So when we talk about the endometrial lining, we're talking about both the cells and the blood vessels. If a fertilized egg comes down, if it, fertilization occurs, it comes down and it is going to implant into that endometrial lining, and we're gonna show the egg here in blue, the fertilized egg in blue, and it actually does physically burrow into the endometrial lining. At that point, it's going to need more blood supply, and the hormones produced by the egg are going to trigger more blood supply to come in in order to provide oxygen and glucose and other nutrients. So that should implant into the endometrial lining. At the bottom of the cervix, um, bottom of the uterus, we have the cervix. And we talked about how the cervix is also smooth muscle. And that is going to close off 
the area between the uterine cavity and the vagina. However, you do have to have an opening for sperm to enter and for childbirth for the infant to come out of the uterus. So there is an opening called the OS, OS. That opening has to be there, but you also want that closed unless you have ovulation or childbirth. So you want to have it closed because the vaginal canal itself has healthy microbes. So just as we talk about um, many areas of the body having healthy microbes that keep out growth of pathogenic microbes, we're going to have good bacteria and good yeasts that are growing within a healthy vaginal canal. Those microbes are great, you want them to be there, but you don't want them to go into the uterus because the uterus should be aseptic, which is another word for sterile. If these get into the uterus, they can cause a severe infection. So the os has this plug of mucus that sits inside the os opening in order to keep microbes out of the uterine cavity itself. That's usually very effective. However, there is one time when you do want things to be able to get from the vagina into the uterine cavity, and that is during ovulation. So here's our little sperm. Sperm would need to be able to enter through the uterine, through the cervix, to get into the uterine cavity to be in place for fertilization. So what do we do then? We're not going to get rid of the mucus plug com completely, but the mucus plug at the time of ovulation is going to actually change its consistency, it's going to change its pH, and it's going to change chemoreceptive chemicals, as well as enzymes that are going to make it a good transmission or rather a good um, pathway for sperm and the sperm are actually going to then be able to swim through the mucus plug up into the uterine cavity. So this is really the major overview. That was all you really needed to know about the female reproductive anatomy and I have a couple of self-review slides that you can take a look at. I will post some of the answers but um, you should be able to find the answers for all of these within the lecture itself.